Welcome and thank you for joining us for our online service at Chestnut Street Presbyterian Church, the oldest African-American Presbyterian Church in North Carolina. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, pro proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Good morning, members and friends, and welcome to Chestnut Street Presbyterian Church's online worship service. Even though we are meeting virtually, we are still communing together. Now for our call to worship. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refugee is in God. Trust in God at all times, O people. God is a refugee for us. Our opening hymn is Bless the Lord, O My Soul, followed by greetings from Reverend Sean Palmer. Good morning, church. We bring you greetings from the amazing Chestnut Street Presbyterian Church here in the middle of Wilmington, North Carolina, on what is called our North Side. Uh, we are, core, of course, are, uh, I get to say this with good gusto, that we are not just a beautiful, amazing church, but we are the historic Chestnut Street Presbyterian Church with a beautiful history um, as the oldest black the Presbyterian Church in the state of North Carolina. Um, and so we greet you wherever you are. We hope that you are safe and wrapped in tissue paper and bubble wrap and you are doing well on today. Just a few things I want to bring your attention to uh, about what's going on at the church. Uh, surprisingly, in the middle of COVID, um, in the middle of the start of a Biden and Kamala Harris uh, 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 presidency um, and era, we are extremely busy at the church. Um, we, I am so uh, happy to announce that we are participating. Our church is uh, serving as one of the places where one a tele television show is taping. Um, and so we will get to see Chestnut on television, on, on stars, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the show is called High Town. So we are excited to be a part of their production. And when you see us on television, we want you to shout us out and maybe send us a clip because um, we are excited to see that. Also at the church, um, we want to let you know that we have, I am so grateful that our session and our clerk session and all of the people who make up our church 
um, have decided that our sanctuary will be a space of healing, that our church will be a space of healing as we help um, so many to access the vaccine in this bumbled rollout effect that is coming out of the Trump administration. Um, and we hope to see Biden's uh, help or right-sizing fixing of the, uh, of the rollout uh, really begin to take hold. And I just want to say I am so proud that our church uh, was decided that it didn't matter if we didn't, we weren't the biggest church, it didn't matter if we had all the technology, it didn't matter if we knew how it all was going to work out, but that we decided to be a space where people would get their own, uh, their own vaccination and be a space for healing. Uh, for our land. I think that is exactly what the church should be doing and I am just so grateful that with a, without a heart of asking what can be done for us or what are we going to do to benefit from it and are they going to tell, you know, are they going to give us 25 vaccines uh, that we decided as a community to honor our commitment to healing the land and I, I just thank you for being the congregation that you are. I just want to remind you um, that we are in the middle of our own um, study um, around reset and so many of you have been listening in the sermons on reset and we thank you for that. Um, we are thank we want to thank our brother pastor uh, for coming last week um, and, and we were excited to have him as a part of our uh, congregation. We want to remind you that we now have um, uh, brothers and sisters around the country, around the city are participating so you might see a few new faces in our congregation and we will let you know that they're gonna tell they'll, they'll, they'll let you know who they are when it's time and so we want to we don't want to spoil the fun of trying to figure out if our congregation has new faces or not um, I take it no I take it as a um, I, I don't take any, uh, any it's not my doing but I do take it as a privilege and a, um, at, to have people decide that even in pandemic that they need church home I want to remind you as well that February we will begin our new, new, new Bible study um, as we are we will participate in the Lenten season. We have a couple more things that we're going to roll out for Lenten season, but you should be all prepared given the church that we serve with all these amazing educators that we will have Chestnut U, Chestnut U. So Chestnut University will come to you and we will give you some more information in the coming weeks about how you can participate um, with us in that project. Thank you. And now for our welcoming announcements. Good morning and welcome again to Chestnut Street Presbyterian Church in Wilmington, North Carolina. Please listen to the following announcements. Our worship service can be seen via Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom. To the family of Helena Lee, who passed on Monday, January 11th, 2021, a graveside service will be held at a later date. Cards may be sent to 114 Longford Drive in Somerville, South Carolina, 29483. Please keep her family in your thoughts and prayers. To the family of Freddie Dingle, who passed on Thursday, January 21st, 2021, funeral arrangements are incomplete at this time. Please keep his family in your thoughts and prayers. In order to continue our prayers for the people and in lieu of prayer cards, please email your prayer request to, she to Elder Sheila McRae at shemcrae at aol.com or call her at 910-763-2277 to, to submit your prayer list. Please contact her by 8 o'clock p.m. on Thursdays. Prayer and Evangelism Team Info The team urges all church members to pray for the church each Sunday at 7 o'clock p.m. Please join in on the prayer conference call on Mondays at 7 o'clock p.m. Dial 1712-770-4010 and enter the PIN number 792-374-POUND. To mute or unmute during the call, hit star 6. Due to additional health issues, Reverend Whitney Fauntleroy will be moving to a nursing home until further notice. Her new address will be forthcoming as soon as she is settled. And for our January birthdays, we have Nicholas M. Morrison on January 26th and Susan Thompson on January 29th. And now for our passing of the peace, 
As we continue to worship virtually, we ask members and friends to reach out to someone in the church or in our community and wish them the peace of Christ. Now our call to confession. When Jesus emerged from 40 days of temptation in the wilderness, he called for us to repent and believe in the good news of the gospel, to turn away from our sin and temptations to sin in order to see and live into all that God wills for us and for our world. Let us confess our sin together. Merciful God, you have called to participate in your reconciling, justice seek work in a broken world plagued by pandemics of race, class, and political division. Yet we acknowledge that we have fallen short of that call. To be honest, we are still inclined to hate our enemies rather than love them as you love them. We quickly, we quickly discern the sins of others but fail to acknowledge our own. We seek accountability for others but not for ourselves. We confess these sins, O oh God. Help us to hear your call to repent, to reorient our lives to your purposes and to believe in the gospel. Amen. And now for our assurance of pardon. God's mercy abounds, forgiving us, restoring us, and setting us in the right path of justice and peace. Friends believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and empowered to live into God's kingdom as it struggles towards realization now. Our prayer of illumination. Holy One, pour out your spirit upon us that we may hear your word and respond faithfully to it. Tell us what we need to hear and show us what we need to do to follow Jesus Christ our Lord. Our next selection is God is Real. comes from Nehemiah 8, 9, and 2. Again, the scripture for today comes from ne Nehemiah 8, 9, and 9 through 12. Sorry. Um, I'll be reading the new Revised Standard Version, but if your Bible says Bible, you are in good country. Um, and so again, we are reading from Nehemiah verse, uh, chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. And it reads, Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I'll repeat it, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
The Levites came all, calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been known, that they made known to them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Why don't you bow your hands in a word of prayer with me this morning? Oh God, we thank you, thank you, thank you for a day that we've never seen. We thank you, oh God, for all the beautiful things that you are doing in our lives. We thank you, God, for hope and promise and passion and joy. We thank you, oh God, that for a future that seems to still be steeped in hope. And God, even as we are addressing, or even as we address death, even as we experience death, even though as we experience grief, oh God, even though we experience the grief of our own very, very own Freddie Dingle, we right now, oh God, we pray. We pray that your peace would surpass our understanding. We pray that you would give us an opportunity to hear a word from on high. And so, God, if you would, just move Reverend Sean Casca Palmer right on out your way. And I'll and allow a word to come through him to us from you. It is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. The sermon for today is simply reset your joy. This January, as we set, as we start anew in pandemic with the coup, a transfer of power and impeachment, a black woman as a vice president, a Georgia has gone blue and 400,000 plus people have died of COVID. I have asked a lot of you, church. I've asked quite a bit. I've asked you to do some hard uh, soul searching. I've asked you to reset in the middle of pandemic. I've asked you to reset your compassion and your passion. I've asked you to reset your dreams and your dreaming. And today I come on behalf of the one who sent me to ask you to reset what seems like might be impossible. Today God is calling us to reset our joy. I know, I know, I know, church, I know. This seems like a crazy ask in the middle of so much death and pain and turmoil. It seems counterintuitive to find joy in the middle of sorrow. And I must admit, I'm not fully sure I even embrace the message I'm about to preach to you right now. You see, what I'm seeing in the word of God is even, God is even difficult for me. If I can be honest and vulnerable this morning, uh, this word is not easy. Because as a pastor and an educator, I can find myself just doing stuff that I have to do, not stuff that I want to do with joy. Just working through life. If I'm being honest, I just want to run away and spend time on a COVID-free island and drink virgin pina coladas with my wife as that plays in the sand while his au pair watches him or his bro pair watches him. I don't want to answer my phone. I don't want to preach. I don't want to talk to students. I don't want to look at grades. I don't want to teach. I don't want to do none of the, I don't want to pay bills. I don't want to do none of that stuff anyway. And for sure, I would say that even my joy as a pastor sometimes is, can be found waiting. I am just like your church. I try to keep a positive attitude, but I find myself sometimes, if I'm being honest, it is exhausting to smile when the world is falling apart. And you don't know what tomorrow will bring and still we have to count it all in joy. You don't know who's next to come down with COVID and you don't know who will make it and who will not. You don't know and I don't know if the vaccine is really gonna roll out or if it rolling out. <laughs> you don't know when we'll be able to go back into school. We don't know if we're gonna be able to hug people ever again. And to watch my own members of this congregation, the congregation that I love, not be able to celebrate the amazing lives of, in music and testimony and prayers and church food and hugs, to watch people die in this congregation, not necessarily of COVID, but just to pass on to the next realm of their life with God, and not be able to do any of the things that the church is normal that the, that the church does normally, just kind of gives me the blues. You see, brothers and sisters, you are not alone. Your pastor is right here with you. And I know that many students I teach want to give up. I know that many of my friends are just simply holding it together. I know that some of you are continuing to work through your own depression and just try to get up day by day. So, brothers and sisters, I, again, I say to you, I know what it's like, and I know you're, we're not alone. 
And what I know is that grief will feel that this sadness we feel, this anger we feel, this disappointment we feel is real. And resetting joy, resetting your joy isn't about sidestepping your grief, you see, beloved. This is not about bashing you into a fake kind of happiness. This ain't about you smiling through your pain. This ain't about that. Because I, like the Bible will tell you, the Bible will tell you better, there is a season for everything. There is a season for sorrow and grief and anger, child of God. This is not what I'm trying to tell you to do. This is, you are great, you are good to hold on to your grief. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to have sorrow in your life. So when I tell you to reset, I'm not really telling you to give up necessarily your grief. I'm just telling you to think about your joy. This is about being able to know that there is something richer, deeper, more abiding down deep on the inside of you. This is about the kind of internal spirit guidance that even in the valley of the shadow of death, you can say, I, I will fear no evil. This is about knowing that he makes me to lie down in green pastures, lush, beautiful green pastures where mountains can be seen and the water is overflowing. Uh, in, in those kinds of green pastures where we can see the deer that pants, even when you are living in a desert with snakes and cacti. Things, this is about a deep abiding and understanding that the table spread uh, by God is that the God is making for you is still in preparation. He's still in the kitchen cooking up something great, even though the enemy of, uh, of disease is already present, even though the enemy of disappointment has already shown up, even though the enemy of your backstabbing friends have you bleeding on the floor of betrayal, even though the enemy of selfishness has come to steal everything in your house. And Somehow you still believe that God has a table set before you. And here, child of God, is joy, a God-given spiritual gift that will give you sometimes the emotion of happiness, that will let you enjoy a joke when everything says you should get off the phone, that will have you in tears laughing with friends even though you just buried your mama or your daddy or your cousin. See, you find joy in your belly, joy in your knowing, joy in your understanding. And child of God, joy is so often attached perichoretically to hope that you find joy dancing with hope together in your life. And sometimes joy, and I'm not talking about happiness, I'm not talking about some of those other things. I'm saying joy will sometimes speak to you when life seems like the guardrails are off. It is joy that speaks prophetically to you in the middle of trauma and says, this too shall pass. And you find yourself depressed, Sad and angry self starting looking crazy for a moment because joy will sneak up on you and you will begin to laugh, cry. You start laughing when there's really nothing worth laughing about, but you remember something so funny that you just can't stop laughing. Child of God, I'm not making this up. I'm telling you what I've also been through for we are not alone when sorrow and joy are both present in our life and we lean into sorrow and forget that we have joy. And child of God, I'm not making this up. For we find in, in, in Nehemiah that joy is a key component to strength. And I can remember seeing this scripture in the Bible of Psalms I sung, but here in the middle of the early drama of 2021, I find God taking my fingers, my hands, my nose, my heart, and my mind, and dragging me into the middle of Nehemiah 8. And if you know anything about this book of scripture, you know that the Israelites, God's chosen favorite people, are coming out of exile again, back out of the wilderness, back into a physical, spiritual gathering space to live both with God and the 
each other, a spiritual and political community, if you will, and we find them rebuilding a wall to protect themselves. Just as we find ourselves in America stopping construction on a wall that really is about exclusion. In both spaces, you see, both in Nehemiah and in America, the wall is broken. In the biblical writ, the wall is meant to protect from destruction, and in our world, the wall is meant to distract from destruction. But nevertheless, a broken wall is present, child of God. And just like us, if you look back at the text back in chapter 7, you will see not only is there a wall, but there are numbers that are also very important. For in the biblical text, we see that the numbers describe the survivors who are entering the land to convene again after exile. And in our world, the numbers are an indication of all that is lost. But again, it is important to note that in the biblical writ, some of the same elements that we see in our own world show up in the text to remind us that we are not so far from God's word that we can't see how they connect. Numbers and walls are both present differently, though. The Israelites were ruled under a theocracy, you see, while here we are ruled under so-called democracy. But the book of Nehemiah is written from the perspective of, the, of their governor, their president, if you will, who is known to have a heart of God. And even though he's not in the church or, or the religious goings on, me, even though he's not uh, in head of the church or the religious goings on at the time, we find Nehemiah presiding with the help of Ezra, who serves as the chief pastor, if you will. And Nehemiah has decided to bring God's people together to hear the word of God, much like an inauguration that we just attended. The biblical event attempts to remind that even after tragedy, even after trauma, those who are chosen by God are to convene and what? Begin again. You see, church, after the tragedy of being spread apart, terrorized, living and hiding, living as the enslaved, living and dying in the wilderness, the church in the wild must begin to find their way back to the city-state and reinstitute their theological rituals and cultural traditions anew. For real, they were not the same, and in many ways, they had been at fault for their own exploitation. I'm talking about Israel, but maybe I'm talking about America too. They had continued to invite leaders to lead them who didn't love God and who were interested in greed. Maybe I'm talking about both of us this morning. They had continued to stray because they were in love with greed themselves and selfishness, and they were more concerned about being upper class and making sure that there was a $15 minimum wage. Maybe they are just like us. They were more interested in enslaving poor folk than they, just like us, had their fair share of Trumpian despots in office and had found themselves living, unfortunately, with the consequences of their actions. In the same kinds of ways we bear out the consequences of having a mediocre leader who tweeted vitriol day by day but had no national strategy on vaccines, had no understanding of how bills were passed, had decided that elections really didn't matter, he was going to make up his own kind of election, had decided that your money and my money and everybody else's money, poor people's money, were, was designed to aid the rich and had left everybody else literally to die in these evicted streets. You see, the Israelites, just like us, had been living under a kind of kleptocracy when there, where the, even their religious right had thought it was best to be governed by the worst of themselves. And they had no desire at the time to listen to the Lord who made creation, who wanted them to treat their neighbor as they treat themselves. And so here we find them all after that in chapter 8, shook back from exile, finally with good leadership, who loved God, who understood that people needed to do more than just worship, pray, and live well individually. No child of God. You see, Nehemiah was one of those brothers who understood that we were only <coughs> a cause away from our neighbor's death. This was a brother who understood that folk didn't need, just need a theology of love. They needed the ethic of love. And so we find people 
who were now putting themselves back together, standing before God, standing before the government leadership, standing before the ministers, standing before the praise and worship team, being asked to restore the covenant that they had with God. And child of God, can I show up to your doorstep and ask you a little bit of questions that make me sound almost like a lawyer in Perry Mason? Child of God, after all that you have been through, after all the anxiousness and nervousness, after all the survivor's remorse, after all the getting up off your own proverbial deathbed, after all the depression and the election vitriol, after blocking all the people who disturbed your peace on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, how, oh child of God, are you restoring your own life with the covenant that you made between God and you when you first met God? Child of God, this is a pivotal question in the decision to, uh, to have joy as the, in the arsenal of your life. What does covenantal relationship with God who loves you look like? How have you renewed a call on your life to live with God given all that you have seen, experienced, and heard? Child of God, that's what's being asked of the people today, this day and on that day and on this day. And as they began to consider that question, as they began to stand on their feet and get to their knees and pray, and as they began to lift their hands and worship, and as they began to sing, as they began thinking about the kind of political recitation that was getting ready to happen all across the land, somebody decided to read the Pentateuch as a constitution to wear to the, as the laws in the land. Something happened at that biblical inauguration because God clearly moved over the crowd because the people who had been through so much began to think of their lives and ask the question whether, how are they going to build and restore their lives? And they began to cry. And they began to cry because the word that they had disobeyed had sucker punched them in a chest, in their chest, and it hit them in their chest, for they began to realize how far they had been from God when they betrayed God. And as they listened to the Levites, the ones whose job was to carry out the ministerial duties of the people, the ones who was to bring them into the tabernacle, the ones who were to help them lift their hands all over the sanctuary and tell God you love them, the ones who were called to a life of service for the God. You see, as they, the Levites began to speak of the Old Testament known as the Pentateuch, the part of the first five chapters of the Bible, they, the people, the Israelites, began to weep. You see, child of God, worship, prayer, and the reading of God's holy word had brought tears to their eyes. And I can imagine that the people who heard the words of what we call the Pentateuch, the words from what some call the Hebrew Bible. The Christians know it as the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. I can imagine, child of God, they heard Genesis, they heard the words of Genesis saying that Genesis in 1 3, let there be light. Genesis in 1 28, be fruitful and multiply. Genesis in 2 7, God formed man from the dust of God of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, and the man became living being. I know they heard Genesis. 2 and 18. It is not God, it is not God that the man should be alone. He will, I will make him a partner. Then they heard Exodus say, speak to them in Exodus 15, the Lord is my strength and my might and my salvation. And they heard in Exodus 23 and 25, you shall worship the Lord your God and I will bless your good, bless your bread and your water. I will not, I will not allow sickness to dwell among you. Then they were confronted by Leviticus that told them in 6 and 8 that the priest shall make atonement on behalf of your behalf and they will all will be forgiven. And then they heard 8 and, the 8 and 10. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and that was in it. And then they heard 19 and 18. You shall not make vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love thy neighbor as yourself. And then they took in all the numbers had to reveal, and they heard in 6 and 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. And then they heard in 23 and 19, God is not a human that God should block. Then they considered all the things that after they heard Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, then they got hit with Deuteronomy. 
And in 20 and 4, it said, It is the Lord your God who goes with you to fight for, your, for, your, for you against your enemies to give you the victory. And then they heard in 31 and 6, Be strong and bold. Have no fear or dread of them because it is God who is with you. And the people began sobbing as the scripture washed over them and weeping and crying. And they had every right to weep and cry. They had just been through the dismal uh, exile experience where some of them had been enslaved, where many of them were running from things, where people had treated them like uh, they were a child of God and they were not chosen. Some of them didn't know that they were going to live to see that kind of day. But here we find Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites have a collective word in scripture. And so the scripture says, they said, child of God, this is a holy day. This is a sacred day. This is the kind of day that is called a brand new day. This is a day that the Lord has made. And I know you've been crying, but you've been crying long enough. I know you've been waiting through trauma and you go way through some more trauma, but you've been living in trauma long enough. I know that you've been beating yourself up about things that you could not control and things that you thought were that you thought were in your control, but you've been doing that long enough. I know that you think that you are have been left behind, but here is God trying to bring you into your future. And a new scripture right then became written upon the hearts of people and is revealed to us in scripture because after tragedy, what they said is the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength, for it is joy that is the counterbalance to suffering. It is joy that is the response to pain that won't go away. It is joy, the psalmist said, that is unspeakable joy that is to be shared with the multitudes. It is joy that is a part of the restoration and redemptive narrative. It is joy that operates the fuel in the car of hope and gets us moving into our futures. And even though we don't know how the story ends. We, even though the vaccine rollout is shaky, even though the economy is a mess, even though Joe seems to be all too old for the job, even though Kamala will eventually face sexism and racism together at one time, even though they say that HBCUs don't matter, even though evictions are still happening, even though there's still empty bank accounts, even though you still got to fight with students, even though you still got colleagues who don't understand, even though your wife won't let you be great. And when I begin to think things over, I begin to realize that below all of the sadness, below my crooked smile and my gap tooth, below my blues narrative and my misery, below my foster care trauma, below all of the anti-blackness I have faced, I still have joy. What kind of joy do I have? The kind that won't, that the world didn't give, <laughs> the world can't take away. What kind of joy do I have? The kind of joy that is unspeakable. What kind of joy do I have? The kind of joy that the psalmist said I can count on. What kind of joy, church, do you have? The kind of joy that is in, that is the fruit of the Spirit. What kind of joy, church? The kind of joy that comes from being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who are carrying us into our beautiful destinies. What kind of joy that reminds, the kind of joy that reminds you that the Lord is with you always. And child of God, I got good news for you. It's not just my joy. It's not just the Israelites' joy. It's your joy too. And you can trust the joy that God gives to you. You can be empowered by the joy that God gives. You can be made whole, washed in joy. You can reset the bones and become new just by a deep dive into your own mysterious, lavish, beautiful, spiritual understanding of joy. Oh God, we lift up the family of Wanda Sloan and Barbara Robinson and Albert Leach and Evelyn Tony Williams and the Todd family, Reverend Whitney Fogleroy and 
Reverend Dr. Rachel Stevens and Cornell and Bessie Slade. We lift up Sister Moore, Elder Paula Moore. We lift up Johnson Crump, Pittman Carr, Fel Felton Ford, and Sid Berry families. We lift up Tom Timothy Moore Sr., oh God. We lift up Elizabeth Mitchell. We lift up Timothy and Paula Moore together as a couple. We lift up Dana Jones, the family. We lift up the North Chase community. We lift up Alden Pittman. We lift up jo Joanne Talbert. We lift up the family of Reverend Ordinal Jones on her passing. We lift up the Lloyd family, and Liliana and Sean, and Tommy Fairley, and John H. Bradley, and Leon Reynolds. We lift up, again, we lift up Reverend Farber. We lift up the family of Freddie Dingo. We lift up Pat Austin, and Willie Thompson, and Theodore Johnson family, and Linnell Jordan, and Ruth Waddell, and Abby Dunlap, and Wesley O. Nixon, and Cla Claude Dixon, and the McCray family. And we lift up our nation's leaders. And we come to you, O oh God not knowing all the words, not knowing what is, all the intricacies of anybody's going out. I lift up also my uh, good friend Christina, who was on the front lines, who was there when the coup happened in the, in the White House uh, or in the Capitol. She was there and she still went to work and still participated in the inauguration. I don't know what kind of strength she has, but we lift them all up, God. We lift all of those people up. We lift every family member up. We lift, every, we lift everybody up that is listed on our list. We lift everybody up that is not mentioned, that it still is in our heart, oh God. We lift up all of our families. We lift them up right now to you, oh God. And God, may you sift through all of these things, may you sift through all of these things and figure out the desires of our heart and figure out the desires of the heart of those who are grieving. And God, we know that they're going to have weeping for a night. We know that night might mean one day, two days, three days, four hours, five days, 10 weeks, 20 weeks, two years. But God, you said in your word that when you bring that thing to pass, when weeping comes to an end, they shall know joy. And so God, we ask, oh God, that you be with us and walk us through these barren lands that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we are in difficult water right now. Be with us as we're still sifting through the trauma of living through pandemic and living through COVID and living through all of the things that make life difficult like racism, oh God. And we ask, oh God, that you would be with us, that you would remind us that we are not alone, that you would send your heavenly body, your angels to come down to us and to minister to us, to give us direction so that we do not give up on ourselves and give up on the mission and the covenant that we have with you. So God, go into the homes of every elderly person who lives, who's lived a life of goodness and joy and hope and wisdom and God remind them that they are not alone, that this is not the way that they're going to end, but God, they are, they are lifted up with a family and loved ones who care about them. God, allow us to live more into the kind of church that you would be proud of. Allow us to live more in thinking about the neighbor, thinking about the neighbor as ourselves. Allow us to be the kind of place where people come and fall in love with you all over again, even if we have been, even if the church has been at the center of their pain. God, allow us, allow the people who have called for these prayers to come to pass, oh God. Allow for them, oh God, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to be able to have words to minister to. The, the word, the right words to say that will speak life in dead situations. God, give us joy unspeakable. A joy that is not shaken by break and divorce and disappointment and vengeance and anger. A joy that restores. A joy that is a vaccination that is a balm in Gilead. A joy that is so powerful, God, that when we, even in the middle of not being able to see and hold each other, we still believe we are in community with you. Oh God, allow our joy to be as present in exile from the physical church as, it, as our sorrow is about not being able to Give us joy. Give us peace. Give us health. Give us strength. For it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And now for our call for tithes up in offerings. God is the giver of life and source of all that is good. We acknowledge the abundance of gifts that have been showered upon us and now return a portion of them in the hope that they might serve G they might serve Christ's purposes in our community and in our world. And now for our prayer dedication. God, we offer our gifts to you that we may be sanctified and dedicated to ministries of reconciliation and justice in our church. 
our nation, and our world. Receive these gifts as a sign of our commitment to follow Jesus as his disciples. Amen. And now our affirmation of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing children, healing the sick and binding, of the, of the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the deaths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raises Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Our closing hymn is God Has Smiled On Me.